I'm Margot Pilatus. Welcome to Study English IELTS Preparation, where we look at the skills you'll need to write, read, speak and listen to formal academic English. In today's episode, we're talking about pronouns. We'll also have a quick look at homonyms and then take some time to practice using suffixes. But first, we're going to watch a clip about people who suffer from eye problems. The people in this community live far from the city, so it's hard for them to get medical treatment. They have no access to specialists at all and they cannot travel because they are poor and uh, most of them have cataract and they are blind because of cataract which is preventable. The resources aren't here really to take care of them. It would mean a major upheaval if they got to the stage where they couldn't be taken care of here. They would have to leave their home, their friends, their family and go somewhere where they could be cared for, which is miles away in remote communities. The professor is talking about the access of residents in the Mora community to eye specialists. He talks about the residents by using the pronoun they. Pronouns are words that can take the place of nouns. They're words like I, you, they, who or what. We can use pronouns in a number of different ways and they take several different forms. They can act as subjects, objects or possessives. If we look at they, the subject form is they, the object form is them, the possessive form is their. Listen to the professor talk about the residents. They have no access to specialists at all and they cannot travel because they are poor and uh, most of them have cataract and they are blind because of cataract which is preventable. Here, they is used as the subject of the sentence. Did you notice that the subject and verb agree in number? They're both plural. The professor always says they have or they are. Let's listen to the clip once more. Most of them have cataract and they are blind. The resources aren't here really to take care of them. Both the speakers use the pronoun them after the preposition of. Most of them take care of them. Let's see how we can use them with other prepositions. We can say of them, to them, by them, for them, in them, on them, with them or at them. Now listen for the possessive form of they, there. They would have to leave their home, their friends, their family and go somewhere where they could be cared for, which is miles away in remote communities. Here, there functions as a possessive adjective. It describes ownership. There is used to talk about things that belong to the eye patients. The patient's homes, their homes, the patient's friends, their friends, the patient's families, their families. So there are three forms pronouns take. The subject form, like they, the object form, them, and the possessive form, their. The word their is a homonym. Homonyms can be words that sound the same but have different meanings, like there, T-H-E-I-R, and there, T-H-E-R-E. -E. Julie is talking about their home, their friends, their family. Is that T-H-E-I-R or T-H-E-R-E? -E? We know from the context that she is talking about ownership, who the friends, home and family belong to. So we know which spelling of their she is using. T-H-E-I-R. Their friends, their home, their family. Another example of a set of homonyms is H-E-R-E -E and H-E-A-R. They're both pronounced the same. Here. Listen for here. 
the resources aren't really here to take care of them. She says the resources aren't really here. The context tells us that when Julie says here, she means in their immediate location. She is using H-E-R-E. -E. The resources aren't really here. There are two different types of homonyms. The ones we've looked at so far are called homophones because they sound the same even though they are spelt differently. Some other examples of homophones are sight and sight, sail and sail, fair and fair, and through and through. So homophones are words that are spelt differently but sound the same. Another type of homonym is a homograph. Homographs are words that are spelt the same, but in different contexts, the word will be pronounced differently. Some common examples are read and read, wind and wind, live and live. Let's try an exercise about homographs. How would you pronounce the word in bold? She read the instructions carefully. We've already seen how some words are pronounced differently depending on their context and function. And when we looked at they, them and their, we saw how the form of some words will change depending on the context and function. Another way that words can change is by adding suffixes. Suffixes can be used to create a new word with a new function and meaning. First, listen for the suffix ubble. They have no access to specialists at all and they cannot travel because they are poor and uh, most of them have cataract and they are blind because of cataract which is preventable. Cataracts are preventable. By adding the suffix ubble to the verb prevent, we form the adjective preventable meaning able to be prevented. We can add the suffix ubble to a number of other words to form similar adjectives. For example, read becomes readable, count becomes countable, and recognise becomes recognisable. There are many other common suffixes in English. Learning suffixes is a quick way to expand your vocabulary. Let's take a look at two other common suffixes, ist and ism. We can use ist when we talk about the people who do certain jobs. So you could be a journalist, a chemist, a geologist or a psychologist. We use the suffix ism to talk about beliefs, ideologies or movements. For example, Buddhism, modernism, realism, or Marxism. And the people who believe these ideas can sometimes be described by adding the ist suffix. So we get Buddhist, modernist, realist, or Marxist. So let's take a look back over what we've learned today. We've looked at how words change according to their function and context. First, we've looked at pronouns and the different forms they take, subject, object and possessive. Then we talked about homonyms and the two different sorts, homophones and homographs. And we finished today with a few different suffixes, ubble, ism and ist. If you'd like to spend more time on any of these topics, have a look at the Study English website. It's at abcasiapacific.com slash study English. That's all for today. I'll see you next time for more Study English IELTS preparation. Bye bye.
Hello, I'm Margot Politis. Welcome to Study English IELTS Preparation. Today we're going to look at using the word say in four different ways. To give examples, to narrow down, to quote and as a filler. Our story looks at the anti-cancer qualities of the ginseng plant. Listen for the word say. What they found, say, in the case of, of ginseng is that it is something that is, is difficult and slow growing uh, in the wild and even in field cultivation. So you can imagine uh, ginseng, to have a mature plant, it might be there for a period of say four to seven years. While it's in the ground, uh, you know, it can suffer from pests, pest problems. Um, I've heard of, of instances where growers have had the, the crop in the ground for say five to six years. They've been keen to keep it that extra year or two to, to say form the right shape of the ginseng plant and then they've been struck by pests virtually overnight. The speaker, Dr David Armstrong, uses the word say in several different ways. Listen to the first one again. What they've found say in the case of, of ginseng is that it is something that is, is difficult and slow growing. The word say in this clip is used to introduce an example. In formal English, instead of using say, we would use for instance or for example. Have a look at these sentences. They have found, say, in the case of ginseng, that it is difficult to grow. They have found, for instance, in the case of ginseng, that it is difficult to grow. They have found, for example, in the case of ginseng, that it is difficult to grow. So say can be used to introduce an example. Let's listen to another use of the word say. So you can imagine uh, ginseng, to have a mature plant, it might be there for a period of say four to seven years. Say in this clip has another meaning. It's used for narrowing down a time period. It means around or approximately. Listen for another example. I've heard of, of instances where growers have had the, the crop in the ground for say five to six years. The crop has been in the ground for say five to six years. So the word say here narrows down a time period. The growers have had the crop in the ground for say five to six years. The growers have had the crop in the ground for around five to six years. Dr. Armstrong uses the word say in one more way. Listen here. They've been keen to keep it that extra year or two to, to say form the right shape of the ginseng plant and then they've been struck by pests. He says to say form the right shape of the ginseng plant. Say here is giving the speaker time to gather his thoughts. It's used as a filler. He could have said um or one of the other language fillers. For example, to say, form the right shape of the ginseng plant, to um, form the right shape of the ginseng plant. There is one more use for the word say, to quote. When we report what someone else has said, we call it indirect speech or reported speech. Speakers often introduce indirect or reported speech using the verb to say. Listen how the reporter talks about Dr McManus's new approach to cancer treatment. Dr McManus says it's a whole new approach to cancer treatment, using the slower acting, milder, traditional herbal compounds as well as Western cancer drugs to try to make conventional treatment more effective. The reporter is quoting Dr McManus. She is talking about something that he has said. Dr McManus says, it's a whole new approach. So we've looked at four different uses of the word say in that one short story. This one word, say, turns out to be very useful in English. The story we've watched about ginseng provides us with lots of vocabulary relating to the topic of health and well-being. Now let's listen to Dr McManus talking about the benefits of ginseng. 
Listen for the vocabulary that relates specifically to this topic. Dr McManus says it's a whole new approach to cancer treatment, using the slower acting, milder, traditional herbal compounds as well as Western cancer drugs to try to make conventional treatment more effective. Mild doses every day is believed to keep the body in equilibrium and just to maintain general health and vitality and stamina. And the other perhaps more valuable application is when someone's dying, uh, it's believed to have life enhancing properties so because of that it commands very high prices. Um, I saw in, in Beijing in a herbal pharmacy there one plant, a 50 year old ginseng plant worth $100,000. It's because of the active components increase with age over time so a one year old root is nowhere near as valuable as a six year old root and of course a, a wild 50 year old root is incredibly valuable. He uses a lot of health related words. He says doses, body, equilibrium, health, vitality and stamina. Did you notice how these words were combined together? Let's listen again. Mild doses every day is believed to keep the body in equilibrium and just to maintain general health and vitality and stamina. Dr McManus says mild doses every day is believed to keep the body in equilibrium. The phrase mild doses is a collocation. In English, some word combinations commonly go together. These combinations are called collocations. There is no particular reason for these words to go together. They just sound right to a native speaker because of habit, history or usage. Collocations occur in both noun phrases like mild doses and verb phrases such as to keep the body in equilibrium. Let's look at some common noun phrase collocations. We say high prices. High collocates with prices. We don't say large prices or big prices. We say high prices. We say a tall building, not a high building. Collocations are not just about the words that go together, but also the order they go in. We always say black and white, not white and black. We say salt and pepper and hot and cold. Another important collocation is the way we say directions. English speakers always say north, south, east and west in that order. The topic of today's story is a collocation as well. Health and well-being. These nouns are often used together in this order. Listen to Dr McManus again. You'll hear him use a number of other collocations, such as general health, valuable application, life enhancing properties, and high prices. Mild doses every day is believed to keep the body in equilibrium and just to maintain general health and vitality and stamina. And the other perhaps more valuable application is when someone's dying. Uh, it's believed to have life enhancing properties so because of that it commands very high prices. Choosing the right word combination will make your speech and writing sound more natural. Also choosing the best collocation will enable you to express yourself more clearly and precisely. So today we've looked at the word say for giving an example, narrowing down, quoting and as a filler. We also looked at some collocations relating to health words. Don't forget that you can go to our website for the transcript, study notes and exercises for today's story. And I'll see you next time for Study English. Bye bye.
I'm Margot Pilatus. Welcome to Study English, IELTS Preparation. Today we'll travel to Western Australia to take a look at a famous Jarrah forest. And while we're there, we'll learn about words that we use to describe spatial relationships, where things are in relation to one another. Later on, we'll listen to a few proverbs. But first, here's the Western Australian Jarrah forest. Our Jarrah forest is our reference point. It's our library of information. This is our baseline. This is what we had before we mined. I think some of the outward signs are showing us that it's quite healthy. The proof in the pudding is not you and I sitting here today, but the proof of the pudding might be in 10 years time, 20 years time, and whether this forest is flourishing for our children and grandchildren. So far, so good. Dr. Bowger knows a lot about the forest. In the clip, he spent a lot of time describing where things are. When you're describing where things are, it's important to be precise and accurate in your description. You need to think about how you're going to order the description. You should try to arrange it in a logical way, according to some kind of pattern. You might describe things in one area at a time, so you can guide your listener through the space. Look at this picture. You could, for example, describe from the top to the bottom, from the left to the right, or from near to far. That is, you could start describing the foreground, the middle distance, and finish with the background. There are no rules on how to describe something. Just make sure that your description is clear and logical. Here is Dr. Bowger again. Notice how he describes the forest area. On our left here, we have a very good example of the Jarrah Forest, the famous Jarrah Forest of Western Australia. And on our right here, we have the, the contrast, which is the mined area. And on this area, we can see the rehabilitation has occurred about three years ago. Dr. Bowger uses descriptions like on our left and on our right. He helps us understand the location of things by using the preposition on, along with a noun phrase. These are preposition phrases. When we want to describe where things are, we usually use preposition phrases. Let's look at some of the common prepositions you can use to describe where things are. Above, below, beside or next to, in front of, behind, on the right, on the left, on top of or over, under, between or even surrounded by. Let's listen to Dr. Bowger once more. As well as using these prepositions, he uses another word to show exactly where things are. Can you hear it? On our left here, we have a very good example of the Jarrah Forest, the famous Jarrah Forest of Western Australia. And on our right here, we have the, the contrast, which is the mined area. And on this area, we can see the rehabilitation has occurred about three years ago. He says, on our left here, on our right here. Here is an adverb. We can use adverbs to help us describe spatial relationships, where things are. The two most useful ones are here and there. Or you can use other adverbs of place, like somewhere, anywhere, everywhere, and nowhere. In today's clip, Dr. Bowger is not just telling us where things are, he's also trying to compare the different areas. If you're trying to compare two or more things, a good description needs a starting point. What's Dr. Bowger's starting point? Our Jarrah Forest is our reference point. It's our library of information. This is our baseline. This is what we had before we mined. 
His starting point is the Jarra Forest. He calls it his reference point, his baseline. He means that he can compare other landscapes to this particular Jarra Forest. Okay, so we've looked at some words you can use to describe spatial relationships in a description. If you need more help, just go to our website. Learning new words is an ongoing process. It's good to learn words in phrases because they are used in a certain way. Sometimes we come across more unusual groups of words. Listen to the clip and see if you can hear an unusual expression. On our left here, we have a very good example of the Jarra Forest, the famous Jarra Forest of Western Australia. And on our right here, we have the, the contrast, which is the mined area. And on this area, we can see the rehabilitation has occurred about three years ago. This is world's best practice. Our Jarra Forest is our reference point. It's our library of information. This is our baseline. This is what we had before we mined. I think some of the outward signs are showing us that it's quite healthy. The proof in the pudding is not you and I sitting here today, but the proof of the pudding might be in 10 years time, 20 years time, and whether this forest is flourishing for our children and grandchildren. So far, so good. Dr. Bowger says, the proof of the pudding. The full saying is, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Can you guess what that means? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. A pudding is a soft, sweet dessert. The saying says that you can't tell if the pudding is good until you taste it. It means that you can only judge the quality of something after it has been tested or experienced over time. So Dr. Bowger means we won't be able to tell how healthy the forest is for a long time. The real test will be how healthy it is in the future. Traditional sayings like the proof of the pudding is in the eating are called proverbs. Proverbs are general sayings that give advice or tell us something about life. Every language has its own proverbs. The Japanese say that getting up early brings you merit. But in English, we say that the early bird catches the worm. Many proverbs in English come from the Bible or well-known poems. Because proverbs are well-known sayings, they aren't always quoted in full. For example, people just say, when in Rome, referring to the old Latin proverb, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Listen to Dr. Bowger again. The proof in the pudding is not you and I sitting here today, but the proof of the pudding might be in 10 years time, 20 years time, and whether this forest is flourishing for our children and grandchildren. He just says the proof of the pudding. He doesn't say the whole proverb. Proverbs are usually found in informal language. Using them naturally is not easy. The meanings of common proverbs aren't always obvious, so the only way to learn them is to memorise them. Using proverbs takes time, so be patient. And that's all for today. We've looked at describing spatial relationships. We saw how prepositions like on can be useful when describing where things are. Then we tried using adverbs to help with our descriptions. And we looked at proverbs, traditional sayings. So why not go to our website for more on these topics? You'll find the story, transcript, exercises and study notes. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I'll see you next time for more Study English. Bye bye.
I'm Margot Politis. Welcome to Study English, IELTS Preparation. Today we're going to look at paragraphs. But what's a paragraph? Well, it's a group of sentences that are related and develop an idea. You need to use paragraphs in any formal writing you do, especially in the IELTS writing test. Let's listen to a weather expert talking about clouds and then we'll look at how a paragraph works. Clouds have two effects. Now clouds obviously decrease the amount of incoming radiation, that is heating, from the sun. That then affects how many more clouds form. It affects how hot it gets in the daytime. At the same time, clouds at night time prevent radiation or heat escaping from the earth. This not only affects temperatures, but it affects the atmospheric systems, the winds, then the humidity and how everything occurs. Jim Arthur speaks clearly on the topic of clouds. What we have here, when it's written down, is a really good paragraph. A good paragraph consists of three main parts. A topic sentence, supporting sentences and developing sentences. Let's start by looking at the topic sentence. The topic sentence provides the main idea of the paragraph. It tells us what the paragraph is about. Here's Jim Arthur introducing the subject he will be discussing. Clouds have two effects. Clouds have two effects. This is Jim's topic sentence. There are two parts to his topic sentence. Clouds have two effects. The first part tells us the subject. The subject is clouds. The second part tells us the controlling idea. The controlling idea is that clouds have two effects. This is what the rest of the paragraph will discuss. Let's listen to Jim discussing the effects. Now clouds obviously decrease the amount of incoming radiation, that is heating, from the sun. In his second sentence, Jim states one of the effects of clouds that relates to and supports the topic sentence. Clouds decrease the amount of incoming radiation. This sentence is called a supporting sentence. Listen to him continue. That then affects how many more clouds form. It affects how hot it gets in the daytime. These two sentences further develop or support the idea expressed in the supporting sentence. They're called developing sentences. Developing sentences provide examples, back up, explain, illustrate or clarify the point made in the supporting sentence. Listen to the next sentence in the paragraph. At the same time, clouds at night time prevent radiation or heat escaping from the earth. This is the second supporting sentence in the paragraph. It supports the topic sentence. It gives the second effect of the clouds. They prevent radiation or heat escaping from the earth. Now Jim develops the idea further. This not only affects temperatures, but it affects the atmospheric systems, the winds, then the humidity and how everything occurs. Jim clarifies the information in a developing sentence. He tells us that clouds affect atmospheric systems, winds and humidity. Let's summarise how paragraphs work. Paragraphs consist of related sentences that develop an idea. The idea is introduced in the topic sentence. The idea is supported in the supporting sentences. The idea is further developed with examples or clarification in the developing sentences. There are different ways to structure a paragraph, but these basic elements occur in all of them. When you practice writing paragraphs, try to make the ideas clear and provide details to strengthen the points you are making. Also do this when you're speaking. An important feature of a good paragraph is coherence. 
Arranging your ideas logically will help provide coherence and get your message across. Now let's look at some vocabulary about the weather. The clips we've seen feature a weather expert, Jim Arthur, talking about clouds. He's a meteorologist. He studies meteorology, the science that looks at processes in the Earth's atmosphere that cause different weather conditions. Jim works in Darwin, the capital of the Northern Territory in Australia. Let's listen to him talk about the particular weather conditions around Darwin. Around Darwin we get tropical cyclones because we're close to that hot water to the north of us. We also get continental thunderstorms which come off the land, very violent thunderstorms with a mixture of hot arid dry air and hot humid air. We get uh, monsoons, classic monsoons, where, where the northwest monsoons come in for weeks on time. Jim mentioned three words describing weather. Cyclones, thunderstorms and monsoons. These words describe severe and in some cases violent weather conditions. A cyclone is a violent tropical storm or hurricane. A thunderstorm is a storm with thunder and lightning. A monsoon is a period of heavy rains and the wind that brings those rains. Many words used in English originally came from other languages. We use them so often that we no longer regard them as foreign. Let's look at some weather words we've borrowed. Cyclone is from a Greek word. Monsoon is a Portuguese word. Typhoon, which is a tropical cyclone or hurricane, is from the Chinese Typhoon, meaning extreme wind. Tsunami, a large destructive wave caused by an earthquake, is from the Japanese word meaning harbour wave. A tornado is a violent windstorm that circulates around a centre. It's from Spanish and it means turning storm. So in our glossary of words belonging to the field of weather conditions, we can include cyclone, thunderstorm, monsoon, typhoon, tsunami and tornado. Listen to Jim using some of these words. Around Darwin we get tropical cyclones because we're close to that hot water to the north of us. We also get continental thunderstorms which come off the land, very violent thunderstorms with a mixture of hot arid dry air and hot humid air. We get uh, monsoons, classic monsoons, where, where the northwest monsoons come in for weeks on time. Let's finish today by writing a simple paragraph using our new weather words. The topic is English words and the controlling idea is that many come from other languages. My main idea will be expressed in my topic sentence. Many words used in English originally came from other languages. My supporting sentence will add, we use them so often we no longer regard them as foreign. I can use a developing sentence to give examples. Monsoon, tornado and tsunami are words from Portuguese, Spanish and Japanese. Lastly, I might finish with another supporting sentence that reinforces the main idea in the paragraph. English is always changing because it adopts new words. I hope you can put your new weather vocabulary to good use in some interesting paragraphs. To find more information and tips, visit our Study English website. That's all for today. I'll see you next time on Study English. Bye-bye.
Hello, I'm Margot Pilatus. Welcome to Study English IELTS Preparation. Today we have a story about new technologies in medicine. We're going to look at linking in spoken English and then we'll talk about the word there. Let's listen to Dr Stuart Stapleton talk about how he treats patients in other locations using computers and cameras. At the Blue Mountains end, there are four cameras. There's one which stands roughly where I would stand as the team leader in a resuscitation that gets the overview of the room and the patient and the environment. There's another camera that's located above the patient's bed. There's also a camera that lets us look at things like x-rays, cardiographs, um, blood pressure charts and the like. And there's a final camera which is actually a mobile camera which can also be head mounted. So for example, if one of the staff up there needs to perform a procedure which they may have done maybe once or twice, then someone who's got a lot more experience can be at this end and guide them through the process. Okay, thank you. To speak English fluently and sound like a native speaker, it's important to link some words together. Knowing how native speakers link their words together will also make it easier to understand spoken English. Sometimes it may be difficult to know where one word ends and the next one begins. For example, healthy ear sounds the same as healthy ear. When healthy is linked together with ear, a y sound is added. So healthy ear and healthy year have the same pronunciation, shown phonetically like this. Healthy year, healthy year. Normally, the context of the sentence would give you the meaning. Listen to Dr Stapleton talking about a mobile camera that can view x-rays or cardiographs. Listen to how Dr Stapleton links his words but in particular, listen for the y linking sound. And there's a final camera which is actually a mobile camera which can also be head mounted. So for example, if one of the staff up there needs to perform a procedure which they may have done maybe once or twice, then someone who's got a lot more experience can be at this end and guide them through the process. Dr Stapleton, like most native speakers, speaks quickly. Listen to how he says the phrase, which is actually a mobile camera. And there's a final camera, which is actually a mobile camera. Dr Stapleton says, actually, ah, uh, like this, actually, ah. Uh. To make your speech flow as smoothly as Dr Stapleton's, it's important to focus on the last sound of a word and the first sound of the next, and then link the words together. There are different types of linking in English. This is linking type one. Val plus y plus vowel. Actually ends in an e vowel sound and the next word begins with a a uh, schwa sound. Linking these words together we have actually a. Uh. Listen once again to Dr Stapleton. See if you can spot another example of y linking then someone who's got a lot more experience can be at this end and guide them through the process. Dr Stapleton says be at, be at. Be ends with the vowel sound e and at begins with vowel a. Linking these words together with the y sound, we have be at. Let's listen again. This time, listen to how these two words are linked. What sound does Dr Stapleton use to link the two words? There's also a camera that lets us look at things like x-rays, cardiographs, um, blood pressure charts and the like. He says there's also a camera. Did you hear a what sound? There's also a camera. We sometimes use a what sound to link between vowels. Also a, also a. This is linking type 2. Vowel plus w plus vowel. Knowing when to use y and when to use w depends on the end vowel of the first word. High front vowels link with the y sound. High front vowels 
are E, I, A, OI. The sounds that are produced with the highest part of the tongue and close to the front of the mouth. For example, C, me, my, I, way, say, boy, toy. High back vowels link with the W sound. High back vowels are U, AU and O. Sounds that are produced with the highest part of the tongue but close to the back of the mouth. For example, who, to, how, now, go, slow. Look at the sentence. Have you ever been overseas? Have you ever been overseas? Notice you ever. You ends with u, a high back vowel. So it links with linking type two, the w sound. It becomes you ever. Now let's consider another aspect of Dr. Stapleton's interview. He uses the word there in different ways. Here's the clip again. Listen for there. There are four cameras. There's one which stands roughly where I would stand as the team leader in a resuscitation that gets the overview of the room and the patient and the environment. There's another camera that's located above the patient's bed. Dr. Stapleton uses there to talk about the position of the cameras. He says things like, there are four cameras. There's one which stands. There's another camera. In these expressions, there is used as an introductory subject. It's used when we want to say something exists somewhere. There is not the subject, but rather an empty word that fills the position where the subject is usually found. It doesn't contribute meaning. It's used because the sentence would be grammatically incorrect without it. The real subject follows the verb. There are four cameras. Notice that the verb form of the introductory subject agrees with the real subject. The real subject is plural, four cameras. So he uses the plural form of the verb to be, there are. So we have, there are four cameras, but there is another camera. Now here's another use of there. And so for example, if one of the staff up there needs to perform a procedure, which they may have done maybe once or twice, then someone who's got a lot more experience can be at this end and guide them through the process. In this example, Dr. Stapleton says, one of the staff up there needs to perform a procedure. There is used as an adverb to mean in that place. So there can be used as an introductory subject or as an adverb of place. Listen to Dr. Stapleton in this clip and see if you can identify which way he uses there. There's also a camera that lets us look at things like x-rays, cardiographs, um, blood pressure charts and the like. And there's a final camera which is actually a mobile camera which can also be head mounted. He says there's also a camera and there's a final camera. These are examples of introductory subjects. So today we've looked at two different linking types in spoken English using y and w. And we've talked about there being used as an introductory subject and as an adverb. And you can get more practice by going to our Study English website. You can read the transcript and check the study notes. And there you have it. I'll see you next time on Study English. Bye bye.
I'm Margot Politis. Welcome to Study English, IELTS Preparation. Today we're going to learn about lasers, what they are and how they work. We'll also practice structuring a description of how something works. And we'll work on our vocabulary for describing colours. Let's begin by listening to Imogen Jubb talk about the history and the science of lasers. Lasers are used in all sorts of settings, like welding, cutting, surgery, communications, reading barcodes at the supermarket, or reading the information stored on a CD or DVD. There are many types of lasers, but they all have three main parts to them. They all have an energy source, such as a lamp, some sort of feedback mechanism, like this pair of mirrors, and also some medium, like the ruby crystal, which can amplify the light. Now, the first laser was built in the 1960s. It was made from a ruby crystal, some lamps and two mirrors, one on either side of the crystal. I've got a sort of model of it here. The lamp shines white light onto the crystal, which is represented by this tube. Pumping energy into the crystal actually gives off light at a particular frequency to produce a particular colour. Some of this light bounces backwards and forwards between the two mirrors and passes through the crystal each time. Each time the light goes through the crystal, it gets amplified, stimulating the same energy release in other parts of the crystal. So, after many times in between the two mirrors and many reflections passing through the crystal, you end up with a very strong narrow beam of light that is just one colour. One of the mirrors is only partially reflective, so some light passes out as the laser beam. Before Imogen explains the laser to us, she starts with an introduction or orientation. That way, we know what to focus on. If you're describing a device or a tool, it's a good idea to introduce it by naming it and describing what it's used for. This is useful in spoken English and it's also a good way to begin if you are writing in formal English. Listen to how Imogen introduces the laser. Lasers are used in all sorts of settings, like welding, cutting, surgery, communications, reading barcodes at the supermarket, or reading the information stored on a CD or DVD. She talks about the function of the laser and lists a few of the things we use lasers for today. In formal writing, if you were to introduce a discussion of lasers, you could structure your opening paragraph in a few ways. One idea would be to start like this. A laser is a device designed to intensify a beam of light. Or you might choose to write, the diagram is of a laser designed to scan barcodes. But Imogen chooses to begin by telling us what lasers are used for. She begins, lasers are used in all sorts of settings. In your introduction, you could give some background about the device. Once the device has been introduced, you can talk about it in more detail. Let's listen to Imogen describe the parts of the laser. How many parts are there and what are they? There are many types of lasers, but they all have three main parts to them. They all have an energy source, such as a lamp, some sort of feedback mechanism, like this pair of mirrors, and also some medium, like the ruby crystal, which can amplify the light. She talks about three main parts. All lasers have an energy source, a feedback mechanism, and a medium to amplify light. In formal writing, we could structure this information in a number of ways. We might say that a laser consists of a number of parts. Or, all lasers are comprised of three parts. Both of these sentences are structured to include a subject, a verb, and 
an object. You would then follow with a list or another sentence detailing exactly what the three parts are in order. These are the energy source, the feedback mechanism, and finally, a medium to amplify the light. Imogen then explains how each part of the device functions. Let's listen as she describes each part. The lamp shines white light onto the crystal, which is represented by this tube. Pumping energy into the crystal actually gives off light at a particular frequency to produce a particular colour. Some of this light bounces backwards and forwards between the two mirrors and passes through the crystal each time. Each time the light goes through the crystal, it gets amplified, stimulating the same energy release in other parts of the crystal. So you can see how Imogen has built up a clear image of the device. In formal written English, you might finish off by explaining the purpose of the device. You could say, the purpose of the laser is to generate an intense beam of light. Let's hear how Imogen finishes her description. So, after many times in between the two mirrors and many reflections passing through the crystal, you end up with a very strong narrow beam of light that is just one colour. She finishes by talking about what the purpose of the laser is, what it produces. She says, you end up with a very strong, narrow beam of light. So let's review how Imogen has structured her explanation. First, there was an introduction to the object. Imogen told us that we were talking about the laser and then gave us some background. She then moved into the body of the description. She told us that it is made up of three parts and listed those parts. In your writing, you might write three separate body paragraphs, one for each of the parts. Then you'd finish off with a statement of purpose, what the object's overall purpose is. Now let's finish by listening to Imogen one more time and then we're going to talk about colours. The lamp shines white light onto the crystal, which is represented by this tube. Pumping energy into the crystal actually gives off light at a particular frequency to produce a particular colour. When energy passes through the crystal, it gives off a particular colour of light. Light contains all the colours of the spectrum, or the rainbow. These are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. We talk about shades of colour in different ways, most commonly by using light and dark. For example, light blue, dark blue. Or sometimes we refer to nature, for example, sky blue, forest green, fiery red. We also use precious stones to describe colour. For example, sapphire blue, emerald green, ruby red. And that brings us to the end of Study English today. But for more information on structuring descriptions, go to our website. You will find notes, exercises and quizzes to help you. Just go to abcasiapacific.com slash study English. And I'll see you next time for more IELTS preparation. Bye bye.